in speaking with people, I've become aware that there is a general misunderstanding of the implications of what a 2% fatality rate means in association with the uh, Wuhan coronavirus. In particular, if it does become a pandemic uh, in which the majority of the, the population becomes infected. So I thought that I would prepare this brief presentation to show how to calculate the effect of this, uh, of a fatality rate on, on the population and in particular on, on an individual's you know, surroundings uh, and show the derivation and then and talk a little bit about uh, the uncertainty that we have in our understanding uh, as of now. It is uh, currently the 5th of February, 2020. I'd like to begin by giving a summary of the equations that uh, are derived here. For those of you that just want to uh, skip to the, the end. So if we're given that the fatality probability of a disease is little p, then the probability of there being exactly little n deaths within a population size capital N is given by the combination of capital N little n multiplied by p raised to the little n multiplied by the quantity 1 minus p raised to the capital N minus little n. So that C-O-M-B-I-N, that is the mathematical function combination. And there are many ways to express that mathematically. Uh, this particular function I chose because it is used in Microsoft Excel. And I thought that it would be uh, the function or the tool that, that most people have access to. So once you're able to calculate the uh, the probability of exactly n deaths within a population, it's possible to calculate the expectation value, or what you would think of as the average, and the variance, which is roughly uh, a measure of the uncertainty. So this equation, this comes from uh, thinking about you know, gaming and think about playing a game in which there is a probability of winning the game little p. So I, I guess in this case, winning is, is a, a fatality, but uh, it's more cheerful to think about winning. So let's talk about winning the game. And we'll say that each time you play the game uh, is independent of the others. So this could be uh, a process, for example, you're rolling a dice and each player, uh, they have a uh, win or loss that's independent of the others. So it's possible that everyone wins or no one wins or, you know, exactly n players win. And further, we'll assume that each player plays the game exactly once. So, you know, you're not going to get uh, reinfected. And this also makes the assumption that uh, there's uh a pandemic in, in which all people are exposed, which really there is a good chance that uh, not everyone will be exposed, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. So if one pl person plays this game, capital N equals one, then the probability of there being exactly zero wins is one minus P, you know, one minus the probability of winning. Uh, and the probability of there being exactly one win is p and i think this this makes sense now thinking about there being two players well then the probability of there being exactly zero wins is the probability of each player losing uh, multiplied by each other so that's going to be one minus p multiplied by one minus p and the probability of there being exactly two wins is p squared then if we want to talk about the probability of there being exactly one win, well, there, there's two ways to achieve that. It could be that the first person wins, the second person loses, or the first person loses, the second person wins. So that would be P multiplied by one minus P plus one minus P multiplied by P. 
And it's noteworthy that if you take you know, all of these, you add them together, the probability of zero, one, and two wins, it adds to one. And that's because under the rules where everyone plays exactly once, there must be exactly zero or one or two wins. So the sum has to be equal to one. It, it's normalized. And this continues on as we increase n. What about three players? Well, if there's three players, then the probability of zero wins is one minus p to the third. The probability of exactly uh, three wins is p cubed. And now talking about the probability of there being either one or two wins, we have to count up the number of ways that can be done. So exactly one win could be win, loss, loss, or loss, win, loss, or loss, loss, win. In the case of the probability of there being exactly two wins, it could be win, win, loss, win, loss, win, or loss, win, win. Now talking about four players, we can start finding these patterns. And in particular, we see that the probability of there being exactly zero wins is going to be uh, p to the zero multiplied by one minus p to the fourth. So p to the zero or anything raised to the zero power is just one. Uh, and the one in front of it tells us that there's only one way to achieve that. Going down to the bottom, we can say that the probability of there being exactly four wins is again one, only one way to achieve it, p to the fourth multiplied by the quantity one minus p raised to the zero, which again goes to one. So this is you know, consistent with our uh, you know, thoughts about one, two, and three players. And then as we move through one, two, and three wins, you know, we just advance the uh, exponent in front of the p and the one minus p. And then in front of that, we have to have a means of uh, counting the number of possible ways. So for example, in the case of the two wins, there's six possible ways to achieve that. Now this x, this uh, counting the number of ways for it to happen is called a, a combination. And there's different ways to express this mathematically. Uh, and in fact, you can write this out exactly uh, using factorials, uh, but we're not gonna derive that here. What you should know is simply that you know, this function is very common in all mathematical toolkits. And uh, in particular, in the case of most spreadsheets, such as Microsoft Excel, they use uh, C-O-M-B-I-N as the uh, name of the function. So this gives us our result. This gives us our uh, definition of uh, you know, capital P as a function of capital N and lowercase n. The probability of it there being exactly little n deaths within a population size capital N. And from that probability, and we know that this probability is in effect a, a proper distribution and is normalized, we can use that to calculate the expectation value and the variance. And again, these are just from the definition and make certain when you're writing out these definitions that you include uh, zero in your sums. If you don't include zero, then uh, you wind up with values that are significantly higher than what you would expect. So let, let's, let's talk about the implications of this. So I have 11 students in my research group. So if the fatality probability is, is 2%, then that means there is an 18% chance that exactly one person is going to pass away, assuming that everyone is infected. But we know that, at least from the, the limited data we have, and, and that's because, you know, we're really looking at, uh, you know, 20,000 people infected. And if we go back in time, say two weeks, you know, that's, you know, closer to uh, eight to 9,000. We, we know that the fatality rate is actually closer to uh, between two and four. So we don't exactly know what we're looking at, but 
what if the fatality rate is 4%? Well, then that means that there's a one in three chance that I'm going to lose exactly one member of my research group. And that's not a small number. That's uh, actually fairly alarming. Uh, it's something that I, I would not uh, bet on that, uh, those odds at all, uh, particularly with something as, as important as uh, you know, the people's lives that I care about. Let's think about uh, a, a larger number though. For example, I'm a member of a, uh, a material science engineering graduate program and we have about 50 students. Well, if the fatality probability is 2%, then you can see that uh, you know, the probability of zero deaths is about uh, 36%. The probability of one is around 37. So there's a higher probability for there to be exactly you know, one death. Uh, and moving to a, a fatality rate of 4%, it becomes even more alarming because you start seeing that you know, the probability of zero deaths actually is about half of that of seeing either one or two deaths. And, and this, you know, when I think about the people that, that I work with, it becomes worrisome because I, I would uh, really hate to see things happen to, to these people. So what, what about the expectation values? Well, going to a 2%, we have a, you know, at a population of size 50, we expect one death. And, and that's entirely consistent with our intuition, right? If we say, oh, a 2% death rate, that means two out of 100 or one out of 50. So that, that gives us uh, confidence in uh, this calculation. I mean, it is completely consistent with our intuition. Uh, and similarly, as we go to a 4% death rate, then that means there should be two deaths expected for every 50 people. Something that did surprise me, though, is the, uh, the width of the variance. Uh, for a 4% death rate, the variance is, is around six people. So the uncertainty, roughly speaking, is that, well, we have one death, you know, plus or minus six. And uh, again, that's, that's a little bit alarming. Now, all of this is, is uh, predicated on, on information that we, you know, is, 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 uh, is lacking. So for example, uh, we don't know how contagious the virus is, right? If it becomes a pandemic, you know, presumably it's, it's fairly uh, aggressive and all evidence is that it is a fairly uh, aggressive virus in terms of the uh, infection rate, but we don't really know right now. And, you know, uh, something that a person could do is they could take the results from above and they could go back and they could inc include a, uh, you know, a, a probability to become infected. Uh, now, admittedly, uh, the CDC right now seems to be indicating that it is likely that this will become a pandemic and there will be person to person uh, transmission uh, in you know, countries across the world, including the US. Uh, we have yet to really identify what the practical means are of preventing person to person infection. Uh, we know that, that many of the healthcare workers that have been you know, treating uh, victims in Wuhan have themselves become infected and presumably they were wearing masks and gloves and you know goggles and all the proper uh, personal protection devices so it's not entirely clear how to prevent the infection and it's also not entirely clear if we're going to have a vaccine anytime soon I, i've seen estimates in the news anywhere between weeks to years for developing a vaccine, and, and of course, this is ignoring uh, the you know the kind of the mandatory testing that we typically see in uh, you know uh, most most uh, Western countries. So uh, I'm not entirely certain that that would be uh, important. Uh, I assume not. Uh, but even then, after we have the vaccine, you know, we want to figure out how to uh, make. Uh, 
you know, 7 billion doses and uh, distribute it. And, and again, this is uh, something which is going to be challenging. Uh, I assume that there's going to be some form of prioritization, but uh, uh, again, just the, the scope of it is, is actually uh, a little bit mind boggling. Another question is, is the two to 4% fatality rate really reasonable? One thing we don't know is we don't know if the results from Wuhan can be generalized. I mean, uh, we don't know if the population from Wuhan is actually representative of, of uh, the globe. Uh, was the, the population from Wuhan healthy prior to infection? Uh, for example, we know that this is a, a lung infection. Were the people in Wuhan subjected to uh, you know, high levels of, of air pollution and, and this diminished their, their capacity to uh, fight the virus? Uh, is you know, cigarette smoking a significant uh, factor? You know, what was the, uh, the standard of, of health care within the region? Uh, presumably, uh, it, it's actually uh, fairly advanced. China's you know, known to have uh, a decent health care system. Uh, another question is, is uh, about the change in the fatality rate as uh, people have become infected. So we know that about one in five of those infected develop serious symptoms and require hospitalization, and that the recovery period is between two to four weeks. So do we have the resources necessary to hospitalize 20% of the population for two to four weeks? In most cases, probably not. Uh, now, in Wuhan right now, uh, the infections are, are localized to that area, which means that the surrounding regions are supporting the health care and the needs of the infected regions. Uh, they're you know, providing help and they're also providing guards to make sure no one gets out, but uh, those regions are, are still relatively healthy. What happens if the neighboring regions are, are not healthy? Uh, what does this do to the infrastructure? What does it mean for our capacity to um, manage this long term? And what will that do to the fatality rate? Uh, I, I know that moving from you know two to four percent, it, it has a fairly alarming effect on the uh, impact that the virus has on on people. I mean. I go from having a, a one in five chance of, of losing someone in my group to a, a one in three. Uh, what happens if it goes to six? Well, anyway, these these are just kind of thoughts I've had, and it kind of bothered me, you know, having conversations with people that, you know, the uh, two percent fatality rate is kind of downplayed. And uh, it, it really is a, a fairly a, alarming uh, statistic when you, when you start playing with these numbers and, and looking at uh, you know, combinatorics. So I hope that you uh, uh, find this you know, interesting and maybe useful. Uh, thank you very much for your time.